Hello, gentle listeners, and welcome to Coffee and Tequila, the show for people who love stories and storytelling. I'm Alistair. And I'm Zach. That was good, baby. That was good. I only had to do it 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the light show, guys. We're going to be covering Bob Paris today. We'll get into that in, in just, just a bit. Um, but first, what are we sipping on today? What are our sippers for today? For today... We are doing gin and tonics. Oh, you got garnishes, baby. I, I tried to make it nice. I was going to make it off camera so that people didn't see the cans. But we're doing cans this time because it's like pre-made, <laughs> pre-made <laughs> not cocktails. <laughs> They're going to be let down, baby. They're going to be let down. I, know, I, was like, I was like, don't let them know. Oh, my gosh. I mean, now it's opened weird. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, if you guys end up liking this episode, make sure you share it. The best way to support us is to go and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a like, a comment. We'll give you a comment prop. 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 prop, 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 prop. <laughs> I can't even say the fucking word. Prompt. 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 At some point. In no, the, it isn't prompt uh, to we be have on no, time. At some point during this episode, we'll say, guys, hey, comment this. Um, that's the best way to really help us on on. On all platforms, it helps us to like kind of move up and get our reach out there and, and further our reach. The more the more five star ratings we have on uh, the 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 Apple and Spotify, the uh, the more people are going to see it. So we're really pushing that here. Um, okay, well, what do we want to cheers to? Uh, cheers to gay rights. I guess gay marriage. Right? Gay marriage. Okay, let's do and that. Our gay marriage. Because we're gay married. All right, so we're going to do the ad break first just because we want to get into the story and we don't really want to break it up. So um, as always, this episode is kindly being sponsored by Helix Sleep. We love our Helix Sleep mattress. If I was Kit, what did we say we were going to (laughs) do? If you're Kit Hudson? (laughs) If I was a kid, no. Kate Hudson. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, Okay. We're always on the separate pages, I swear. We're never on the same page anymore. No, I remember. (laughs) If if you were kidnapped, no. When I'm kidnapped for three days. Okay, ad starts here. When I was kidnapped for three days and held hostage against my will, I was sleeping on a cold, dark floor, and all I wanted was to sleep in my Helix Sleep mattress. And now I can, because I have a Helix Sleep mattress. <laughs> We've had our Helix Sleep mattress for two years now. We've, we started with a queen size mattress. We now have a king. It's perfect. I was sprawled out every which way the other night. Um, it just has so much size and so much comfortability. Helix knows that everybody is different and everybody has their own unique needs. And so they've made a sleep quiz that'll match you with your perfect mattress based on your needs. I am an all over sleeper. Alistair is more of a side sleeper. He likes a firm mattress. I like, uh, you know, more medium. We took the quiz together and we got the midnight mattress. And one of the best parts about Helix is that they deliver the mattress right to your door for free. It comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up yourself. And if it makes you nervous to buy something online that you haven't tried, Helix has a 100 night sleep trial, so you get more than three months to make sure that you absolutely love it. And if you don't, they'll pick it up for you and you'll get a full refund. Now, if you or somebody you know is in the market for a new mattress and you think that Helix sounds right for you, you can go to helixsleep.com slash tequila where you can get up to $200 off of your mattress and two free pillows. Mm-hmm. Alrighty, we're back. We are going to be talking about Bob Paris today. Um, we I had a live stream a couple weeks ago, and I was asking for topics, like which topics you guys would like to hear, and somebody brought up Bob Paris, uh, uh, an openly gay bodybuilder, and I was like, and, and he brought up Rod Jackson. I keep thinking Rod Stewart, and that's going to really trip me up, so if I say Rod Stewart, just know I mean Rod Jackson. Okay. <laughs> it's an, Bob Paris was not dating the the singer Rod Stewart. <laughs> that we know. <laughs> that we know. Allegedly. Um, yeah, and I looked him up and I was like, wow, that's I've never heard of this. And I that sounds really interesting. So whoever you were that <laughs> leave thank it. Thank you so much. For, thank you for the suggestion. Um I also really want to thank John P. Thomas, who emailed us really like, great articles. Like four emails full of just articles they'd been collecting over over time all about Rod, uh, Bob Paris and and that whole that whole thing from from when he's coming out into I think the latest one I read was 96 1996. Was it 19? Oh, that, that, I don't was, know. that was the advocate, right? Yes. Yeah. A bunch of like vintage articles. And it's, it was, thank you so much, John P. And that, that really added to our notes. So we had to like go and it shuffle. It up. We, it did buff it up. It did buff it up. It was it, a lot of really good information. Good we're talking about buff guys. Ooh. Ooh. Buff it up. Baby, baby. Um, yeah. Bob Paris, if you don't know, was a professional bodybuilder and he was. N- 
not only notorious for being like one of the best in his field in his sport, but he was notable for being was he the first gay athlete who was like active in his sport to come out publicly? I think yes. so. Yes, yeah, that's the, what the that's first the specification. Gay professional right there. athlete. Yeah, yeah. Um, to be specific, he he grew up in uh, in Indiana, and just like everybody else, was taught from the earliest age that homosexuality was a sin yeah he grew up in a really religious family it seems like it's it's kind of that you know story of religious families that we all have you know the mother was probably was more religious it seems she was always like preaching about god and and the the grandparents are always preaching about god and the dad was like religious by proclamation but in practice he was debaucherous a debaucherous hoe it's a story as old as time. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how it was. But he, he, his family were, they were really religious. And so like being gay, he was always taught that the gay people are the worst of the worst of the worst. Those are the perverts that you want to stay away from, right? So um, he even says that he knew he was gay from about like 10 or 11. And so it wasn't until his teenage years that he was starting to understand what the, to put the label on it, that he, well, yeah, he was to come gay. out to himself. But he knew since yeah. about 10 or 11, right? Um, he, his, his upbringing was, I noticed in like early, earlier articles, he kind of, kind of shies away from his upbringing talking about his upbringing yeah because it was it was pretty rocky it was pretty bumpy well, we got a lot of this his upbringing and the his book gorilla suit oh we we didn't even go into yeah, that we, okay. we, we didn't even go Just into the book really quick yeah we <laughs> he's written a lot of books and we were we kind of like pieced together a story from skimming all three yes. that we and that we did read we read straight from the heart you read straight from the heart straight from the heart um i read generation queer which is his Gen- latest one and, and Gorilla, Gorilla suit. suit. Gorilla suit was is, is the one to go to. It's the okay? most helpful one. All of them were kind <laughs> of like iffy to me, and then I read Gorilla suit, and I was like, mm, I, don't, I I flew through that. Yeah, I, I thought Generation Queer was going to be the way to go, but it's more of a philosophy book. There's not like as much me. detail about his relationship with yes. Rod Jackson <laughs> in in uh, in Gorilla suit, but he does touch on it, and it's Gorilla suit really is his overall story, and I think it is the one that's worth reading. It's a really good book. It's actually it was a really good read. His upbringing was pretty tumultuous um his parents were always fighting they were always breaking up getting back together i think they got married divorced got married again and then divorced again you know it just like was this constant cycle his dad was an alcoholic his dad was very violent earlier in childhood he really did uh show that he was he was quiet unless like you got ta- him to talk about something he was really interested mm-hmm. in right he was really creative really artistic he was super imaginative he had a big imagination so he was always you know yeah, going he, he, he won national scholar awards for, yeah, uh, for yeah. art um and he was like super involved with all of that at at school you could tell that he was kind of an obsessive guy i think I do you know? think he was. I, I think he's definitely an obsessive guy. I think he finds a passion and he like really goes for it. Um, but I also think he has fear of commitment or fear of trying something new or change. I just found so much, so many similarities between myself and Bob Paris. Not in any of the bodybuilding stuff, but just all of his sort of life experience. Like I remember, I started smoking at like 13, 14 years old, and I used to because my parents would buy these big ass cartons of cigarettes, and they smoked. They smoked through cigarettes, so they did not notice if a pack was missing. And so I'd just take a pack, and me and my friends would go to the woods and start and smoking. Smoke. Yeah, um, and so I, I started that really young. But he was a he was a hellion. You know, he was always getting into something. So he was always like, there, there's one instance where he like jumps on the back of a, a wild horse thinking that he can just ride it. And so he grabs it by the mane and he's like, I'm going to, he, he, he's always like, again, he's fixated on things. So he's yeah. like, I'm going to, I'm going to tame this horse. It's very flicka, very like black beauty. You know, I'm going to tame this one. He and was a horse girl. It, but, <laughs> he was, he was, Bob Paris was a horse girl and everybody calls him Bobby um, during yeah. the book. And I think Bobby is so much cuter than Bob. Bob is just Bob. 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 <laughs> it's monotone Bob. Uh, the horse bucks him off and he like breaks bones. He's always breaking damn bones. He's always climbing trees and like falling and breaking his wrist and his legs and his arms. And he's broke so many bones that I'm surprised he could even bodybuild. Because doesn't be a professional athlete. Does that do, do well, some, like permanent it's, it's damage also to your like bones? It has when to. You, when you're a kid, it's so much easier to break bones and recover from it. Uh, when you're an adult and your bones uh, have lost all the elasticity, mm. it's much harder to get that back. Okay. So he's lucky that he broke his bones when he was younger. You know, maybe he should have been drinking more milk. He just like does the things that all kids start doing, right? He like starts drinking and smoking with his friends and smoking pot. He smokes a lot of pot in this damn book. He's always smoking pot. Um, 
And this is, I mean, it's very troublesome to his parents, right? They're seeing him like spiral out of control. They're thinking the devil's inside of him. And so like if, at one point he gets in so much trouble that he has to go live with his dad mm-hmm. when, when his parents are separated. And to him, I think he lives with his dad from this point on, right? He doesn't go back to live with his mom. For, uh, for a while there too. And then he starts getting into lifting. Yeah, he does get into weightlifting. So there's a teacher who sends him to the gym to get a fan in, in one of the back rooms. And while he's back there, he just stays. He just like goes out and starts nosing around and like opening all the closets and like seeing everything that's in there. And there's one door that he opens at the back of the gym and there's like, it's like a weightlifting room. There's weightlifting equipment there that like nobody uses. So it's covered in dust and like spider webs and all this stuff. And he's like, I can do this. And he starts going and messing around with all the, all the lifting gear, right? And he like does a, a full workout before returning to class and he returns to class with his fan and he's like all sweaty and like his back is all black because he was laying, you know, on all the dirt, um, on the, on the, on the weight bench. And the teacher's like, what the hell were you doing? I sent you to get a fan. He's like, oh, I leaned up against the wall. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Uh, he's like, he he lies to get himself out of some bullshit all the uh, oh, throughout this book. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that really like spurs his his love for weightlifting, right? Like he found this and he was like, oh, I, I really like this. This is really interesting. It's like the next day that he's all sore though. I, it sounds like he pulled something too because he probably wasn't working out right. He didn't know what any of the equipment was like working, which muscles. Um and so the next day he's like super sore and like he can't even get out of bed and he just says, Mama, Dad, I'm 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 sick. I can't get out of bed. And they're all like gathered around his bedside and they're like, What the hell happened to you? <laughs> it's like, I'm sore. It's the it's the day after a burn. It is, it is. Um But he gets really obsessed with working out at this point. Yeah. And he starts to see some actual progress in his body. His body changes he, fast, yeah. Yeah, he he's he's liking what he's seeing. And then um he starts to – did he look at the magazines first? Or? No, so he starts getting really into weightlifting, right? And he's his body's changing. Everybody's noticing his body change. He's pretty much sneaking to this gym that he found, you know, um, between classes, after school. He's, like, staying, you know, longer after school to go and sneak into this gym. And he's using this weightlifting equipment. And what he starts to do is use this, this equipment to figure out which – muscles they're they're working right so he'll like do a bench press and see which which muscles he feels it like doing and he's like oh i guess this is for chest i guess you know a curl is for my arms you know very intuitive Uh, yeah yeah he's like super smart in that way right and figuring things out himself and then he just gets so obsessed with it and like getting this size that he starts going to the store and just reading all of these these magazines about bodybuilding and he sees a picture of arnold schwarzenegger and is like obsessed with arnold schwarzenegger right well he's like this is what i want he says this This is is what i want want. this is like this is the competition that i feel like i need to be in this is like this is i i feel it right i think this is and he's reading all about it and the discipline it takes the the structure and i think that's what really enticed him it yes yeah yeah It, 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 it really attracted him towards that and that summer, he you know got permission from his high school football coach mm-hmm. to use the gym all summer, and he just works on it, works on it, works on it, and he gains about twenty pounds. I'm not sure if it's all muscle, yeah, but definitely well, a great deal of muscle. It's that initial like boom, right? You start working yeah. out, and you get an initial boom, and it'll slow at some point. It'll kind of plateau at some point, and you have to really like push past that. But you know, this was the scrawny, skinny kid who starts weightlifting, and he's got I, one thing that's going to come up over and over and over again is Bob Paris is incredibly genetically gifted. Yes. His body is very genetically gifted and he puts on muscle in all the right places. And it's just like that, right? It still takes discipline. I don't know anything about the bodybuilding world, but you know, you know, it takes discipline just to work out and to, to stay in the gym. But, um, it did help that he was very genetically gifted. And he says that plenty throughout this. His mom doesn't like the, how his habit of bodybuilding. <laughs> she like gets really unsettled by it. And she's like, she tries to discourage him. She's like, you don't do this. You shouldn't do this. This is, you shouldn't train no more. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not good for you. It's not good for you. But he wanted to look like Arnold. So all summer, he's just like working and training. He goes to work at the pizza place. He comes, you know, and, and trains. And he's like really disciplined and really focused on like building his body up. And by the time he returns back to, he even buys a gym set for himself at JC like Penney. Penny's. Yeah. And that summer he goes from, he gains, he goes from 165 to 200 pounds by the time the school year starts again. Well, I thought it was 20 pounds. It was 20 pounds gained. initially. And then he gained another um, 15 pounds by the end of summer. I, I, I can't, that boggles my mind. Because that, summer's what, three, four months? So when he starts school again after summer, he, he kind of starts to lose his focus on training a little bit. Uh, he starts football again, doesn't really have the passion for it. So he's not having the greatest season. And he is kind of diluting his training with 
drinking and partying. This is the kind of the point in the book where he says his sexuality is really starting to creep up on him, right? Like, again, he knew kind of from 10 or 11, when you think back in hindsight, you know kind of when you were starting to figure it out. But he was really figuring it out and, and, and telling himself, oh, shit, I think you're gay, around like 16, 17 years old. Um, and this sends him into a tailspin because, again, he's taught that like the gays are the lowest of the low. Of the low. You don't mm-hmm. get any worse than the gays, not even the pedophiles. You know, <laughs> you might as well be a pedophile if you're a gay. That's that's pretty much what is being thumped into his head. By it's these synonymous. Things. Exactly. Um, and so he's just, you know, he's thinking, I'm a pervert. I need to hide this. And so he is pushing it as far back into his mind as he can. And this is also the time where his sexuality, his his sexual urges are coming about, right? Because, I mean, he's a teenager. So he's thinking about kissing boys and, you know, having sexual relations with the boys. And, like, he's fantasizing about that. And he's like, oh, I have to push it out of my mind. I have to push it out of my mind. And so he starts distracting himself with, like, drinking, partying, smoking weed, him and his friends are like skipping so much school. I couldn't believe how much school they were skipping. Uh, they they would just write themselves sick, sick notes, notes and hand them to the teachers, and everybody was catching on. They were doing it so often. He was skipping. He was calling it a work. All this, you know, so often that his boss was getting mad at him, and the teachers even caught on and were like, "You're out of school a lot. You're really sick, aren't you?" And he he ends up telling all of his teachers, "I have leukemia, but don't tell anybody. I'm keeping it really private. Just please don't tell anybody. But I have leukemia. That's why I have to be out of school so often." Um, and then they get caught because they're out of uh, they're they're out of school one day and they're partying at a friend's house and the friend's dad comes home and like calls the school, calls all the parents, you know, and he, <laughs> the German teacher asked the, asked the principal, how's uh Bobby Paris's leukemia going? And so like that whole lie just unravels. He's just spiraling out of control during this time. Right. And he's really suicidal. These gay feelings, the, you know, uh, all the places that he's lacking in life and he, f- he's feeling stuck. It's all like coming and bubbling to the surface. And so he's really suicidal. He mentions that he writes really long, suicide notes and like fantasizes about killing himself and then he'll go out and like burn the notes you know um and you know there's the, he was he was going through it i i think that especially as a gay person it's it's something that's very relatable yeah so after he's kind of caught at school, you know, and, and everybody kind of knows that he's been skipping and all of that, he is going to go to this party and he decides he's not going to go to the party. So he finishes a bottle of Jack, drives out to a secluded area, sits up against a tree and he has a shotgun. And so he puts the shotgun in his mouth and he's like crying and he's fully about to pull the trigger and ready to just end it all. He's, he's pushed to this point. He's like having so much emotional turmoil in his own mind. That's it's so sad because it's pushed on to him. Like these, yeah. these feelings, right? Um, if we just accepted people, maybe, you know. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue, especially queer youth experience a lot. You know, this is unfortunately very common. Yes. And later in his career, he does a lot of work trying to prevent um, queer youth from, from feeling suicidal and, you know, bringing them out of that. That becomes like a passion of his. Um, and luckily the gun doesn't go off. He passes out before he's able to pull the trigger. So he passes out and he comes to and he... It's like a miracle he didn't kill himself. So he it's like, fuck. He gets back in the car, he drives home, and his dad's waiting on him. And his dad, like, beats the shit out of him because he's gotten calls from the school, from parents, you know, all of these different things. And has pretty much learned that his kid is, like, you know, spiraling out of control. And instead of helping his kid and saying, hey, let's get you some help, um, he, like, hits him really hard. And Bobby Paris, again, is is a pretty big dude by now. You know, he's, like, six foot. He's, you know, 200 he's, pounds. he's bulking up. And so... He doesn't really, he like gets on his feet pretty quick and his dad kind of like steps back a little bit and he notices his dad has a little bit of, he's showing a little bit of fear, but his dad like quickly like bucks up again. And it's just this, this, instead of talking about our feelings, (laughs) he has to beat him into submission. And, uh, so they, all the, all the teachers, I guess, have heard about the suicide attempts. So they're all pretty easy on him. They let him like make up his work. Um, it's clear it's just so clear that he was going through it and he was going through such emotional turmoil, but nobody was really helping. They do like require him to go to a therapist, but all the therapist does is ask him if he's gay. He's like, do you happen to be a queer? (laughs) And then he just like left the therapist. He just like doesn't, he stops going. He doesn't want to go. Um, and it's not because it wasn't doing anything to him. He feels like the therapist was just an asshole, you know? Um, Sound like it. He does like get another job. He goes back because he got fired from his other job because it just wasn't going. He gets another job. His dad's able to get him another job. He starts, you know, 
doing what he needs to do, right? Um, he starts to try to pull his life together again, but he does get fired from this other job because uh, a bunch of his coworkers get like wasted and get caught at a bar, and he wasn't getting. He says he wasn't getting drunk or wasted, but he still gets fired with the group of them. Um, and so he goes home, and his dad is pissed again. His dad pretty much strangles him, is like screaming at him, throwing him up against the wall, and kicks him out of the house. And so Bobby. Is, is like very close. He already wants to go to California. His dreams are bodybuilding. He's like, California is the place to do it. I have to go to California. And so he's very close to going to California at this point. And I thought he was going to. I thought this was the point he was going to go to California. But he like bops around town for about a week. And finally the dad, uh, he learns that the dad has been calling everywhere trying to find him, right? And and trying to locate him. And there's just this really, it's uh, it's just this weird, like, kind moment where he finally reunites with his dad again, and his dad apologizes and hugs him and says, I love you, and I'm sorry, and I shouldn't have done that, and it, you know. And it's like, well, then practice that, you know, keep keep that up, because it's clear he has a lot of problems with his dad, and I think his dad was just very abusive, alcoholic, and his dad probably also didn't learn how to, you know, be... A dad? A, a, a dad show feelings, you know, yeah. like taking, you know, use words, use words. <laughs> um, and so they kind of make a Bobby moves back in with his dad and uh, he graduates. He graduates school and and <laughs> he graduates school. He goes into the Marines and goes into the reserves. Yeah, he goes, he goes to boot camp and then he loses a bunch of weight. Yeah, um, a, a bunch of uh, mass, I, I should say. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back and he, he tries to get the mask put back on. Yeah. Cause he starts college like two days after he gets back from boot camp, mm -hmm. and he immediately goes to the gym, right? He starts going to the gym because he's been out of it for a while. And, uh, he notices everybody there is, you know, bulking up and they're, they're all like bodybuilders. And he's like, I, I have to, I have to get back into it, man. And so he starts lifting again and puts on a bunch of mess pretty quickly because of that muscle memory. Um, he enters his first competition at the college and, <laughs> His confidence level in this chapter is like through the roof. This is these are so I understand that like cockiness and confidence and arrogance is is can be unattractive at times, right? But it's do you notice it's always the confident people who have like the most confidence ever? Like they can they in their mind they cannot fail and whatever they decide they're gonna do, it's like it not happens. even a question to them. It's like why would I fail at this? I don't think I would fail at this. There's no reason I'd fail at this. Well, Those are the people that are always succeeding. Well, they, and also they succeed because they actually try. There's so many people who out there who just don't try at all. Yeah. And they obviously don't see any accomplishments because they're not try, trying to do anything for it. At the same time, I feel like if you're going to be starting a sport like bodybuilding, yeah. from what I've learned, you have to be confident. You have to be extremely confident yeah. and extremely egotistical to be able to, you know, you have to believe in yourself to be able to do it. You have to believe that there is no other option than just success. Yeah. Yeah. That you've already won the title. So he's sure he's going to win this damn competition. And he even calculates and like writes it down in a notebook. He's like, okay, so I'm going to win this first competition, my first ever competition. I'm going to win it. And it's going to take me about five years from this moment to, when Mr. to win Mr. America, America. And then that same year, I'll win Mr. Olymp or not Olympia. Uh, I'll win Mr. Universe. Universe. And he's like, why would I fail? Why would I fail? He's, he's quickly humbled. Because he doesn't show up, he hasn't. He like misses parts of his body that he has to shave. The, the world of bodybuilding is so like strict, and yes. and the the aesthetic and the the look and like the, how you have to shave every single last bit of hair off your body. Uh, he was not prepared for this, right? So he's quickly humbled and doesn't even place top six, and they dismiss him from the stage. I think this is pretty interesting because besides seeing pictures of bodybuilding, seeing pictures of like yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger and all that stuff, I didn't really understand what the world of bodybuilding was like. Whenever I heard Mr. Universe, I thought it was like, you know, like Miss Universe. I thought it was like... I, th I thought it was a male pageant. I th that's what I thought. Which that's in a I lot heard. of ways it is. Listen, I haven't heard of any of these um, things. I knew about the Arnold Schwarzenegger like bodybuilding competition, but I didn't know about any of the other ones. I guess Mr. Universe is not... Uh, 
Miss America? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I thought it was the other end of I it. I thought he was going to be walking out and he's like, he's so beautiful. <laughs> With the sash. And he has, a, he <laughs> has like a talent competition and he has you know, a swimsuit competition. <laughs> but one of the things that really attracts him towards bodybuilding itself is he considers himself a artistic person, yeah. but also a very physical person. Yes. And so bodybuilding is very attractive because it can be an art form. He, he described it as like where... where theater and you know where he could do theater and ballet and also be super physical up on stage and really throughout his career uh, a lot of times like his poses are referenced yes. as like the best poses they're ever they're still referenced yeah you know, so he really did treat it like an art form yeah and, 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 and so now right now he's trying to find himself as an athlete within the sport. Yeah. He is has always been kind of a a big supporter of natural bodybuilding and not taking steroids and you know doing it on natural and then he's really uh supported and encouraged drug testing in mm -hmm. bodybuilding competitions and and all of that though he has taken well this is what i'm talking yeah oh, yeah so i wasn't surprised because i watched an interview with him the other day being a proponent he's like he's like i'm not gonna say i've never done steroids yeah. but i don't think that you should do steroids to do this and that's fine because i think that it's especially I feel like you're a lot more knowledgeable having done something yes yeah and then being like okay that's not you for can't, me like preach against drugs and and well, I, mean, I wouldn't you can take, preach you against can, drugs. You and not, can and you not have done drugs. drugs are bad, but like but I would take somebody more seriously. That's why. That's why there's a if, lot of if like you knew their background, like, like drug counselors. A lot of drug yeah. counselors are former addicts because they understand it right and they understand um, how it, how it is to kind of lose your life to drugs. Um, and so it is like I find it really refreshing that he is so open about the fact, and he's very matter of fact in this book. So he does put forth like, yeah. Um, after I lost that competition, I was talking to somebody who, the guy who won the competition, his name is Will, and he said, hey, yeah, have you ever tried this steroid? And he's like, no, I just work out. And he's like, oh, you got to try steroids. Everybody does steroids. And so he gives him steroids, and he does like a whole cycle, and then he's about to do another one before he's like, mm, but I want to see how my body works without it, right? I want to like kind of, you know. Push himself. I want to push myself. And so he does, and he doesn't do steroids. I thought that was the last time he did steroids. It's not. Um, he's going to go back into it. But he, he, you know, he really does the natural bodybuilding thing. Um, Which I think is interesting because like uh, steroids for me, I, I always thought of steroids as like some like illicit drugs and yeah. stuff like that. Which they can be very bad for you if they're not controlled. Like, but if you actually have a physician control the substances for you help you balance your hormones yeah uh they're not bad but they should also they, but they do give you an edge in any professional athletic competition well he says what he says is that the steroids just made him blow through his workouts right like in the heavy weights that he you know had a harder time with he was just like blowing through those and just <laughs> you know it was like super easy for him. i'm would maybe, you do steroids? Maybe I'll do steroids. No, I don't think I would because I, I'm, I'm would scared of the back and I'm scared to lose my hair and I'm scared of like no, my balls shrinking up. That's why you need I mean, to go I to feel, somebody and get them. But I feel like I would be the one who would get all of the all of the side all effects. All of the above. All of them. You're just you're just letting it hold you back, Zachary. <laughs> you go get it. We'll try it out on you first, okay? And if your balls shrink up, then I just won't do it. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> uh, Bob is kind of bumbling through life at this point. He is he like drops out of school. He, he tries two different schools and he just drops out of both of them. He's like, school is not for me. I'm just like bored as hell in school. I really want to focus on bodybuilding. He moves back in with his dad. Uh, he kind of bounces between his dad and his grandparents. He's going through a couple different jobs. He works at a gym at one point. Um, he's really at a standstill and he's like reached the end of what Indiana has to offer him. And he just knows he has to go to California, but he has no money to go to California, right? Um, oh my gosh, every Hollywood story. I, I love that, though. I love the older, <laughs> like, uh, the California stories. California was the land of the dreamers, right? Well, it, it's either it New was, York or California. It was more, I only have 10 <laughs> bucks, and I showed up with a beat-up car. <laughs> drop, drop me at the center of everything, said Madonna. He gets home one night to his dad's, and his dad is like, throwing him out and throwing all of his shit onto the front yard. And so he picks it all up, puts it in his car, and he's talking to his buddy, and he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to California. Are you coming? And But he's like, yeah, I'll go. And he's like, well, do you have, do you have any money? And he says, I got about $1,000. He says, I got 300 We will make it. And they, they drive their asses from southern Indiana to California. They, you know, sleep in the car at, at gas stations. And then they reach California. And they're like, shit, it is expensive here. <laughs> 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 they get their gas. I guess gas is like $10 in California right now is what I've been seeing. So, like right now, right now? Right now, right now. Yeah. 
it's like it's expensive. So I'm back then if they're I saying expensive, I just don't understand it. I don't understand. I love the land of the dreamer, but I just I I don't want to pay that much money to live. They do, and they struggle. They struggle. So he's really trying to get into bodybuilding, but like they are trying to find a place to live. They can't really afford a place to live. They can't afford a place to live because the the place they initially get is a week to week, you know, rental situation. Um, yeah, they they pay you know um, like a week's worth of rent at a time and then uh it, it changes the higher ups say no you have to pay two weeks in advance now or you have to pay two weeks at a time now and they're like we can't afford that so they move out they like sneak out and uh, bob pear starts living in his car and sleeping in his car behind the gym that he's working out at and he's you know he is really struggling he's you know trying to get through jobs he's he he, <laughs> he goes through jobs like nobody's business at one point he's working at a gym another point he's working at a body shop and he always like a couple paragraphs later will be like Oh yeah, and I lost that job. I got I got kicked out of that job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he he really is like laser focused on this the bodybuilding. And at one point he's like, I just might go back to Indiana. Like this is really hard out here. I'm really struggling. I'm fucking hungry. You know, bodybuilding is an expensive thing to get into. The amount you have the, to the eat, amount of food yes, that you have to intake, protein, like three thousand, four thousand calories a day. He's talking. Like, he's like, I have to eat like six or seven meals a huge. day. That's yeah. that's expensive, man. That's expensive. That's a lot of rice and chicken. Um, <laughs> and so he is like nearly going to go back to, to Indiana, but he decides not to. He does stay, and he's like, I'm gonna just stick it out. And that was the best decision he could have made because. Uh, he starts meeting the right people and he starts meeting people who are in who like champions of the, of the sport. And they're like, Oh, you have to work out in Santa Monica. You need to go to the gold's gym in Santa Monica. That's where everybody's at. That's where, the, that's where, that's where it's going to happen for you. Um, there's one guy named Roy who is a, a bodybuilding champion and he takes Bob under his wing and really like starts, you know, preparing him to start competing. Getting out. And when he does start competing, this is like two years. It's like a two year. I, we're going to like kind of, go past all of the details of like his training because I just like, psh. I wanted to know about his diet and work regimen. <laughs> Nobody else does. <laughs> if you, if you do, I, I, I don't think I, I would say pick up his book. Pick up the book. <laughs> it's very detailed in there. You yeah. get the whole thing, but it's, it's a very, it's like a two year struggle. And then when he starts competing in these competitions, he just starts winning. He starts winning again. He's like, he's like his muscles and his build is, is like genetic perfection. So, he is like easily winning these things, and it's uh, it, well, it's crazy because like he's uh, hounded, not hounded. What two thousand six Flex magazine called him the most aesthetic bodybuilder of all time. Yes, they like crowned him that. And whenever you look at him anywhere, that's like the first thing you see: the most aesthetic bodybuilder, most aesthetic. And he bodybuilder. is really aesthetic. So Super I aesthetic, very I, symmetrical. Yes, and I I like his build. I look at his build. Compared to the ones who like are like so shredded, right? Like so so shredded, and then yeah. like you see like every little vein and stuff like. That. He doesn't look like that. He looks different in some way. Well, um, we, we we watched a ton of videos on him yeah. yesterday, and a uh, ton of videos of, of people comparing him to nowadays. Yeah, uh, bodybuilders were uh, back then. It was a lot more uh, about like uh, aesthetics. A lot more about the physique and now it's more about gaining mass you know what i also found really interesting about bodybuilding is he mentions in this that bodybuilding he mentions i i'm gay but i'm not gay because i went into bodybuilding and i i'm not in bodybuilding because i'm gay because apparently and i never would have put this together i just didn't expect this that bodybuilding is was at least back then looked at as a gay sport and that if you were into bodybuilding and you were into that sport and competing in that sport that people assumed you were gay, which is so weird to me. I, which is interesting because he says that that less than 10% of the people he knows in yeah. bodybuilding are gay. And that's a pretty just common num number across the board. He, he, say, he, he said that there's more gay people outside of yeah. bodybuilding that there is in uh, – Maybe it was less, maybe it was 5% of what he said. Well, he says that it's because there's so much focus on the body, right? And anything connected to the naked body, even a partially naked body is, you know, there has to be something wrong with it and people find things to be wrong with it. And because there's a, like a level, there's a degree of narcissism that's connected with bodybuilding that narcissism was already at that point, you know, psychologically connected to homosexuality. Well, the thing is we've had such a stigma for 
so much time in terms of males just being able to appreciate themselves. Just males being able to like dress right. Oh my gosh, you're dressing nicely, so you must be gay. Oh, yeah. you care about? Do you remember when you do skincare? Do, do, do you remember in the two thousands and everybody a, was saying a, metrosexual? Do you remember me, metrosexual? Metrosexual just dressing nicely to, was yeah. just metrosexual. Okay. I'm not like, gay. How is met, was I'm not gay. Thing. I'm metrosexual. But okay. it, it, just like groom yourself. It's okay. Wash it between your cheeks. But the thing is, like, I think it's completely fine for you to aesthetically appreciate another person and not also yeah. be sexually attracted to them. And that's absolutely. And it is a sport. Like that yeah. is, these are athletes, okay? Whatever your opinion is on bodybuilding, whether it's toxic or whatever, they, they're they athletes. They're training. It is very, like, what you're seeing during a competition is not always how they look any, you know, in day-to-day life anyway. They are preparing for that moment, right? So they are, their diet is super, super controlled, super, and it's, like, miserable. I've listened to bodybuilders talk about it. And they all talk about how fucking miserable it is, you know, preparing for a competition. And then when they let go of their competition, you know, they're they're not as ripped as like you're seeing them on stage, right? Well, it it, it kind of reminds me. I had a uh, a wrestler roommate in mm-hmm. college, and it re- reminded me of of that, you know, because you, you, wrestlers have to be a certain weight at all times, yeah. You know, to and and you see them bulking, cutting, bulking, cutting, and that kind of reminded me of this. The only difference with with. Uh, Bodybuilding, it seems like bodybuilding is something you build over time. Yeah. It's definitely like five years. If you're bodybuilding for two years versus bodybuilding for five years, your body's going to look different because you're going to see your body change so much. Yeah. And it's definitely a growth that you have. So whenever they're, they're displaying themselves, yes, they have that artistic element of how they display themselves. But also it's the work that they have put in over the course of the hours they've put in over years of years yeah. of years of work that they're displaying right there with what uh, again because i just didn't know anything about the sport and doing my research on bob paris i've had to like look up shit about the sport and like you know learn a little bit about it i'm pretty damn impressed and it's just so weird to me that it would be connected to being homosexual when it feels so manly it feels like such a manly sport anyway or such like a masculine sport um yeah cause because it's... of you're in the gym all the time, you know? And I guess that was considered, you know, you're you're too narcissistic to be focusing on your muscles. So I, he he puts it in a really interesting way. He's like, if you're not covered up by a suit and tie and you're showing your body off, then you're narcissistic and you must be homosexual. Well, the thing is, if you ever see him outside of just being on stage, he's all the way covered up to his wrist. He is. like he's, He yeah. wears like big, big shirt. I feel like if you can pull off a crop top, go ahead and do oh, it. Oh, yeah, do it. It's the 80s, man. Short, <laughs> plus, short shirts and a crop top. Plus, especially in the 80s, like crop tops. But that was me. Guys mm-hmm. started the crop tops that, while they were working out. Like, that was that a thing. Was back then was the, the straight man thing, right? That was, a straight, that was yeah. the straight man thing. So crop why, tops and Bob Perry's, you should have been wearing that stuff. I know. Just for us. Just for the guys. Where's your merch? <laughs> <laughs> um, he does start coming out to himself while he's in California to and starts like accepting it and being like i am gay this is just who i am he starts going out to gay bars you know really getting himself into the gay scene um he starts telling people in his life so everybody kind of already knows peers we are covering a lot of open secret stories so he's telling his peers he's telling his friends and everybody seems to be very supportive however it becomes an open secret and he competes he he continues to compete and he wins uh, Do you it, want to go into some of his wins? I feel yeah, like, go into some. Of okay, his so wins. Uh, just the just right before that, like Joe, uh, I'm I'm hoping to say his name right. There's a there's a he becomes a, a real favorite of Joe Wider. Why? Is that how Wilder? you pronounce it? It's Wider. What? Yeah, um, that one. W e i d e r. We're gonna say Wider. He is so he's a favorite of Joe Wider, and Joe Wider co-founded the International Federation of Bodybuilders. He also created the Mr. Olympia competition, and started a few bodybuilding magazines that Bob is like featured all over. Like he's plastered all over these these uh, bodybuilding magazines. Like he is a star in the bodybuilding world. Um, and as he's competing in shows, he starts winning just. Everything, you know, so he's first place in Mr. Los Angeles, 1981, first place in Mr. Southern California, 1982, first place in California Muscle Classic, 1982. Who comes up with these damn names? <laughs> <laughs> Second place in Mr. California, 1982, third place in Mr. America, 1982, first place in Mr. America, 1983, and first place, Mr. Universe, 1983, the same damn year. And the same and year those are that his he two said big wins. back then that he was going to win, he's like, I'm going to be Mr. Five America years. and Mr. He said, and hell yeah, he and, did it. And, and, and like suddenly he's, he, I, at this point he's a celebrity. I, 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 I saw his interview like right after he won 
um, I think it was Mr. America. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, right after he, he, he won Mr. America and they're like, what are you gonna do after this? What are you gonna do? And he's like, well, I'm gonna go out and eat, but I have another competition in two weeks. Yeah. So I'm not going to go. Crazy. Oh yeah. He said, we're going <laughs> me and my family going to eat tonight, but then I got to right back in the gym in the morning. It just, it sounds <laughs> yeah. miserable to me. I'm <laughs> well, I mean, uh, but it's also like exciting for him because like, yeah. he's like, you know, I feel so bad for everybody who lost because I know they came in with the same mindset as me that they were yeah. going to win. And yeah, and, and it, he seems like a very good team player at this point. After all of this is said and done, he's like commented on bodybuilding and said, "Yeah, bodybuilding wasn't really. I wasn't really into bodybuilding as much as I was into like the structure and like I knew I was good at it, and so that really like kept me going. You know, I wasn't as as much into the bodybuilding aspect of it. Um, What's interesting because he says that, but then he says other things. I know. Like, it's very conflicting, and I think that it, I just think he's a conflicted parts, person. At parts sometimes. in your life, you're, you're different. You do different things, but like uh, one thing that he's said before is that he wanted to be the best." something yes so he says that pretty early in the book that he wants to be the best at something and whatever he finds that one thing that he wants to be the best at he will be the he, best he, at it he, he, he works will make at sure it. he's gonna be the, he's the tanya harding of the <laughs> gonna do the triple axel and, and so like i thought mr universe was like the best of the best of the best but apparently i think it's mr olympia i don't know somebody correct us on that because i i don't know so the mr olympia he competes in it quite a quite a few times and strangely he never places in the top six. in the toxic to, top six <laughs> Top six. six of Mr. Olympia. <laughs> if you're watching in video format, you get a nice treat. And if you're if you're not watching in video format, go over and check it to video format really quick because we're gonna do a quick reaction to one of his posing. I want to see. I want you guys to see the art form of his posing, uh, because I did not know that this was a thing. I it's thought, beautiful because I only saw like pictures before, yeah. and so like this was him like doing the artistic portion of it. Yeah, because everybody kept saying he's artistic, he's artistic, and I see it. I see it now. So uh, this Bob Harris posing Mr. Olympia in 1988. Oh, so he didn't win this one. Mm. Mm. <laughs> if this was done nowadays, it'd be a Lana Del Rey song. <laughs> it's a mushroom. It's a, it's, it's a performance, right? I thought they came out on stage, did like three poses. I had the, thought they had like a set of poses. I didn't know they have a routine. Yeah, and I, I think it's how well you can display the muscles you have and coordinate it, right? Mm -hmm. And there was also, there were also rumors, like everybody he came out to already said they thought he was gay anyway because his movements were so, like some of his posing was so effeminate is what they said. But I mean, like, they, that's just them being jealous that they can't do it. I know, right. I mean, He's it's ready. like a slow dance. Right? I know. When he comes out on stage, he, they all pose like they're about to do an Ice Princess routine. There's probably announcers for this, right? There's got to be people who like announce it. If I was an announcer, I'd do it just like the announcers for Tom, Tonya Harding. I'd be like, Bob Pierce now. About to attempt the triple axel. Will he land? And he does, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, he does. Oh, <laughs> uh, look. I love that whap. one. I do love that pose right there. It's Look his, at that. It's his WAP pose. That's his WAP pose. He's like macaroni in the pot. <laughs> That's a wet ass Paris. <laughs> <laughs> it's good though. We need that a round good. of applause for you. Good, yeah. I see it. I see it, man. I see it. I see it. Most aesthetic bodybuilder. So he believes that he <laughs> should have won the 1984 and 1985. Yeah. He said that. He said Mr. that Olympia. in like a comment to somebody on on. Instagram and it apparently it, it made the bodybuilding firestorm it's community go. It was like a couple years ago. Uh, that he go said wild! It. it was like in 2020. And then after that, he like deleted in his Instagram and yeah. hasn't been like active but he at said all. He believes that he should have won Mr. Olympia 1984 and 1985. And so we we watched his posing competitions. Yeah, he, he, he looks great. And uh, he said that if it wasn't for like the what steroid heads and. Uh, drug heads and, and like the drug heads and the bigots and the bigots, it the bigots the bigots okay 
So there's there's a lot of speculation that he never placed top six in Mr. Olympia. And this is like, again, this is like the peak of his bodybuilding, right? He was in fantastic shape. There is no reason he shouldn't have been placing that high. Maybe not number one. We watched a video where some guy explained it. He's like, you know, he, <laughs> he like analyzed that comment and he said, he may not be placing number number one against but at least this top guy, three. but it should have been top three, right? And maybe that's his politics. So there was a lot of speculation at the time that he wasn't placing because there were uh, bigoted people and people who had prejudices against yes. him and uh, and who he was, and they were not going to let him. I think at one Ooh. point, even after the after the magazine article comes out um, that we're going to talk about in a bit, uh, so he hears from a friend that the judges were at dinner, and the friend overheard the judges saying, uh, Bob Harris has a Mr. Olympia body, but we can never let him win. He's gay. He has a lot of success, and at some point he decides to retire because he wants to become an actor. So he starts going into acting school and like to, he's, he's built up a nice savings, nice cushy savings. And he's doing all of these seminars, traveling around doing seminar tours to kind of pay for his acting school. Mm -hmm. Cause he really wants to be an actor. He wants to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, that's what he wanted. Um, and so at some point, and this is, we're going to get into the Rod Jackson stuff now. Uh, so Bob arrives in Denver to do this seminar, and it's supposed to be his last seminar, and he's been retired for about a year at this point. Bob is kind of in a depressive episode as well, like he's not really feeling the greatest. I feel like this was because he was trying to transition from something he was so successful at, right, and going into a new career. And that kind of – that can bring on fears and insecurities and doubts and uh, – well, and that could send you into a depressive episode. You're right? also starting over again, right? Yeah. So it's 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 a whole thing about like changing careers. Mm -hmm. You're you're taking all the years of experience that you had, and uh, you're it's not going to help you really. He seems that he says that life seemed worthless at this point. Okay. So this is kind of where I'm, I'm pulling these little stories from the, uh, straight from the heart book by Rod Jackson and uh, it says by Rod and Bob Jackson Paris. Cause they hyphenated their names. Um, we have, don't laugh at that. Cause we hyphenated. Our I names too. think this book was, I understand the intention of it. Yeah. Um, it was so cringy to kind of read, uh, that I couldn't even get through it, and I will get through it. And I think it's something we could maybe like talk about with you guys on a live stream or something like that, and just have like a lot, nice little you know conversation about it. But is this how people feel when they watch our videos? <laughs> because I, I I didn't want to say it, but okay. like it made me feel because I, I read that he said I love you on their first day. So they meet because yeah. So Bob is at the seminar right, and he's giving the seminar, and he meets. They're both like so. The, Every paragraph, every time there's a paragraph break, it's like one of them speaking. So it's really hard to keep up with two. Um, and Rod is basically like, you know, I knew a little bit about him, but I didn't, you know, I didn't really care. I didn't care. I, I didn't even think he was that good looking. I didn't think overly muscular guys were good looking. So I just didn't even, you know, pay him any attention. And when he came in, I was looking down at something and my manager had to nudge me to look up at him. And when I looked at him. It was just like everything stopped, and it was it was true love at first sight. And then Bob I'll switch to Bob's paragraph, and he's like, "It was just true love at first sight. I just knew that that this was the this was the guy I was going to spend the rest of my life with." They say that over and over again. This was just it. This is my soulmate, and I'm not very I'm not very into or not too read up on reincarnation, but I knew that we had known each other in past lives before. And I'm like, "Oh Lord, man, this is Blanche Devereaux speaking." And that's how I read it in Blanche Devereaux's mind. Did you? It's like we had been, been together many times before. Honestly, it it seemed like a very recognizable. It seemed like a very recognizable yeah. situation because I think that a lot of gay people, uh, queer people, mm. get into relationships very quickly. And we're going to talk about that. So they, Bob gives this seminar and Rod is like sitting front row, right? He's like sitting off to the stage and Bob is pretty much giving this whole seminar to Rod and they're staring at each other the whole time. And then they go out to dinner afterwards and they just talk all night. It is really sweet. It is really sweet. And like mm -hmm. it gives, it reminds me of, you know, your first, your first butterflies, butterflies when you're talking to somebody and you're kind of into them. And, uh, they talk about, intellectual things smart people things like politics and books and <laughs> what did we talk about on our first date i don't remember i don't it must have just been life what, right what we were we just we about? just must have just, just it's yeah, just it's live fine. you just talk about life and at the end of at the end of dinner because they're in at dinner with a group of people and at the end of dinner uh bob really wants to uh kiss uh Rob? rod yeah 
Rob. Rod. Rod. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't do it, and instead he gives him his card with his number on it. He says, here's my card when you come to L.A., because Rod's moving to L.A. in about three weeks because he signed with the modeling camp. Uh, agency and he says when you come to LA give me a call and they like talk once on the phone and then for the next six months um, Rod moves to LA they don't really talk but they keep bumping into each other and running into each other and then one day Bob's like I just have to ask him out or I'm gonna bust and I'll be sitting in a rocking chair in 50 years wondering you know about my unrequited love so he asks him to go on a date and he says why don't you come to my house and i'll cook you dinner and so rod goes over to his house that night and they just they have dinner they spend the whole night talking they lay on the floor together they make out they said they make out for like two three hours together um and <laughs> and rod or bob says i love you and rod's like what did you say and then bob gets on his knee and says will you marry me no first date man <laughs> Yeah, that was really quick. That, that was real quick. Yeah. Who else did that? I just said, I love you. You did. I didn't ask you to marry me. We were walking. Um, sir. <laughs> he said, you said you loved him on the first <laughs> date. Um, it was, it's, it's cute and it's sweet, but it's also like, I recognize it, right? This mm -hmm. is like you were saying, this is kind of the gay experience where you jump into relationships super, super quick. You feel and you, it and you're like, oh gosh. And you don't really know if it's infatuation or it's like actual true heart stopping love, right? You just mm -hmm. don't know. And a lot of people like mistake infatuation for love and they can like jump into something really, really hardcore. And you know, it's because it's because we we don't get to have that experience, right? We don't get to like have our first falling in love in high school and like the common ex gay yeah, experience. We, we is talked not a bit that. about this in our last episode, actually. Yeah. And when you finally start getting into relationships, especially somebody that you feel like really, really intense like attraction to then it i mean it, you you could mistake it for anything you know you could it, it just and the, but, but that also does, doesn't mean that they weren't in love oh you that, know? and i'm not saying they you weren't, can always yeah. fall in love and fall out of love and clearly they got married and they were together for seven years so like it was love it's just that is so relatable because we just do that you know we did that it's just you you just do and straight people do it too it's just there is something a little bit more specific about the gay experience and doing that and uh the queer experience and i just i think it was so funny that they were just like from page one i knew it was true love and we'd known each other and many lives before it, it was so honey covered everything was so honey covered that I'd, I'd i'd read about it and honestly like they got me to stand them a little bit a little uh, bit while I was little while bit. I was reading about them. So their relationship pretty much moves fast, and they decide like this is it. This is my soulmate. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. They're both wanting to make it in Hollywood, and so they, you know they're really their lives quickly, quickly, quickly intertangle. Bob was already wanting to come out, but you find your first great love, and you just want to scream it from the rooftops. And this was them getting to do that. So Bob puts puts acting on hold at some point, and. Uh, he has the urge to go into bodybuilding again. And I think, again, it was that fear of, like, going into something new, not knowing if it was going to be successful or not. And he knows that this is, like, a tried and true career that he's already had. And it's he, stability. It's stability. And so he goes right back into that. And he knows that he's like, my relationship is already really turbulent. And uh, I do, this is just a stable career. And I know I could do this. And, you know, Rod's not really happy about it. He doesn't really like the bodybuilding scene. Um, and they have, like, they almost break up because uh, – Rod is basically like, you know, this is like a bastard of a, a relationship if we can't be out and proud about it. So, you know, why even be in the relationship if we're not going to be able to be out and proud? And so Bob, again, was already wanting to come out, and he finally found a publication that was going to publish that story. Because, again, remember, he had been going to different publications and wanting, like, trying to tell a story. And, like, it seems like the bodybuilding community was just so, like, keeping him under a blanket and, like, protecting that part of his story and that they would cut that part out you know any mentions of that they would completely cut it out of the articles the interviews um and he finally gets uh which which magazine is it it's iron man iron man magazine to to publish that story and so the story comes out in july 1989 issue of iron man magazine and the, the headline is bob paris is true to himself i know it, it doesn't say I'm gay, like Ellen. Uh, was was it Ellen that was like, I'm gay? <laughs> was it on Time Magazine, she's yes. just like, I'm gay. she's crouching down, and like, well, I'm gay. Yeah. <laughs> Bob and Rod also got married the same month that Iron Man Magazine came out with the story. Uh, their families boycotted the wedding. They were not supportive of their union at all. They got married at a Unitarian community church in Santa Monica, California. 
they do mention that a majority of the of the responses were very positive and uplifting yes. though and they got like 30,000 letters when this the story broke um bob kept competing but uh and you know, he was still a really highly regarded competitor and every that he didn't really lose respect in that sense um but, but his business was cut about 80% and he he took a huge pay cut and he says that this wasn't really because of audiences it was because of promoters and the promoters were thinking of him as a risk and that he wouldn't sell tickets and so they were cutting business with him and which is interesting because he said that every time he would promote he would sell out yes you know and um, so he had to start balancing stuff out and i i won't say I, I will say it completely jeopardized his entire career, yeah. but it also opened him up for other opportunities like the Oprah Winfrey show. It did. Yeah. So this magazine, it led to a bunch of different things, right? So the bodybuilding community was not really taking this story. They weren't like other magazines weren't really covering it. They were all kind of ignoring it, mm -hmm. um, but it did turn into something pretty big. There was a lot of... Of things that came out of this, right? This very same year that the the initial magazine article came out, they went on Oprah. Did we watch that full segment? The full segment. That was freaking wild, man. We can't go into it all, all here, but it was a wild segment, so it's Rod. I think it's worth the watch. Yeah, there's, it's Rod. It's it's Bob. It, there's a, a couple of lesbians who adopted a child. Mm. Or, no, they, one of she them already had a child. a child, yes. The other one wants, wants, wants to, to adopt, adopt it. Adopt okay. And child. then there were a couple of uh, conservative Christians who were like completely against gay marriage, and it was... You know, Oprah was up in the audience taking audience questions, and Gloria Allred was there, and she was like screaming, and mm -hmm. she, was, she was like, "It's none of your business what they're doing. They, this has nothing to do with." There was she, like a pastor oh, there. Was, she was Gloria Allred was exciting and exhilarating to watch. If you're gonna watch it for anything, watch it for freaking Gloria Allred. She bossed up she like shut everybody down she was so good and it really made me respect her even more that like she really has always been on the right side of history oh my gosh <laughs> well, did, 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 I, I was while we were watching all all the stuff i was obsessed with watching the the talk shows either the daytime or the nighttime talk shows yeah so we watched uh donahue we well before that we watched thick and yeah. Thicks actually took place in 1984, so it was before he came out. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what's going to happen? And then Thick has him take off all his clothes so and get and rubbed I guess down. He, I guess he, like, approved that before he went on it, but it was still such a bizarre interview. And Bob yeah. Harris, like, takes off all his clothes, and they bring up, like, four female audience members, and they just, like, feel him it, up. It, 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 and he's and like, these are four female audience and, members who said that its muscles are disgusting. And but they're all like... <laughs> they're, they, like, keep touching him, even when, like, the... the the touching phase he is even, over. He even touches him a lot too. He's like, it's weird. It's really yeah, it's weird. That's weird. another really weird one to watch. Um, but, but, he but also goes on Donahue, Donahue. And Donahue at first was like, he was a little snappy at them for a little bit. And then yeah. like when people were like. I, I couldn't tell what side he was on. I couldn't on, either. Because first, then there was yeah. a 17 year old girl who was like, I'm going into college. And I just don't think that gay should be out and proud. Because what is going to happen to me when I go to college? Am I going to get AIDS? From and a doorknob? <laughs> And Donna, he was like, it doesn't matter. He's like this old man. It was just, that was a wild one too. Um, but they really, so their relationship is so public at this point that they really start, it, they're monetizing their relationship, right? They, are, they start doing speaking tours about human rights and appearing at pride parades. They're, they have this book, Straight from the Heart, come out. <laughs> Would, 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 uh, <laughs> would, would, the, the book straight from the heart come out and then they have a pic, their Madonna sex book it's not a Madonna sex book it's That's called what it Duo me of. it's called Duo and it's a it's a it's a photography like coffee table book right I think they actually had another one too um they do a bunch of activism work. They're fundraising for AIDS research. They have a foundation now. They're called Be, Be True to Yourself Foundation. They want to legalize gay marriage. It's really revolving around uh, their their image. So, like, yes, they're doing a lot of really good work, mm -hmm. um, and I, that's so commendable. Um, but I think the conversation is I, – I think they got a lot of cri criticism for monetizing their relationship, and it didn't read as genuine because they were monetizing that relationship. Ooh. Now, let me say <laughs> – we may not be Bob and Rod, <laughs> <laughs> but this was something that struck me to the heart. And we're not famous by any means, but 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 we have monetized. I, we have monetized our entire relationship yeah. from year year one for six years now. We've monetized the relationship, and so I completely understand what people are saying when when people are saying that you're you know. Because you are, you are like we made money off yeah. of our relationship. We put our videos out there in our personal moments some of our arguments and like we made money off of those things you know we had sponsors for some of them they were all you know had ad revenue and that can read as disingenuous sometimes so i get it um 
I don't know. I found that really interesting. Well, it, it is interesting because like he's very, whenever they do, because we're talking about this now, uh, whenever they do break up, they're very, they're mum about it. Yeah. They're mum about how they, they broke up. They don't say anything. Uh, anything about that. It, and we, we had a conversation about like, if we had split up, who would we owe an explanation? Yeah. Do you, if you're, if you are choosing to make your relationship so public and put it in the public eye in the way that you are, do you have a responsibility when you, if you break up to, to explain to people why you broke up or that you broke up? And so we were saying like, if we, you know, we've kind of gone out of YouTube for a little bit, like say in three years, we were still doing YouTube. Mm -hmm. If we broke up, do we owe it to people? Do we owe people an explanation? Do we owe people some sort of response to that and, and to address that? Um, so I think if you're still in the public eye mm -hmm. and if you're still, if you're still, if, if you're still putting if, if you're it out there like that, part right. of yourself, if, cause cause in essence, we do give people part of our relationship. You know, if we're giving that, I think that they do owe, are owed an explanation, not maybe everything. Like there's some stuff that you'd keep private. Yeah. You don't have to tell but everything. Like I mean, an explanation, let people understand this. And I, 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 I get where they're coming from. Like Bob, Bob and Rod. I think the only things they really say about it are that Bob says, um, it just wasn't working out because there was, there was a question of balance in the relationship and, uh, we were just at different points and, you know, we were both doing different things. Like he's very, very hush about it. Right. But, and like, I don't think Rod says hardly, I can't find anything that Rod said about it. I, I, I can't uh, find out if he even exists now. Rod's a ghost. We cannot find yeah. anything about Rod now. Um, but you know, I, I do agree with you. I think that we would, uh, we would have a responsibility to let people in because we'd already been doing that. And you can't just like cop out and say, Oh, that relationship's done, guys. No, you, I, you, you're asking questions about why we broke up. Well, that's my personal business. You don't. We don't owe you that. It, it, it's also that, and I, I think one of the biggest mistakes they made. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not here to critique people's relationships. I'm just seeing it in hindsight. Um, is making this a perfect fairy tale. Yes. And I think that we have made an effort to let people know that our relationship is well, not perfect. Well, we've tried. Um. And I think that if we, if like in three years on the flip side, we were not doing YouTube and we happened to get divorced. Yeah. I don't think at that point we owe anybody an explanation, right? No, I agree. But like if we were continuing to put our relationship in the front and center and let people in on that, then we, we do have a responsibility to them to let them know what's kind of going on. Because these are people who, you know, our viewers are people who like invest, invest time their time and energy. into, into what, what's going on in our lives, right? Yeah. And to just like completely cut them out without any sort of explanation or warning i think is 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 completely it feels absurd it feels wrong to me it does feel wrong um, um and so this was a couple that and uh listen they they did nothing wrong by i don't believe they did anything wrong by completely putting their relationship in the public eye in the way that they did right because they wanted to be role models we yeah we do that we do that. There are plenty of couples that do that. This is, we are in the age where everybody's putting all of their shit online. There are so many gay couples who are, you know, putting their whole relationship online and we're part of that. And so for us to criticize anything like that, it's just like, you know, that would be so hypocritical. Um, I get that they did that. And I, I really, and I, I, I am really appreciative because these are people who came before us, right? Yes. I'm really appreciative that they used that to do good things. It doesn't matter if you do, it doesn't matter what their intention for doing that, whether it was attention that they were seeking, like they were seeking attention or they were uh, like genuinely just wanting to be good role models. They still did good by what they did. Well, and, and the things we definitely benefit, I mean, marriage was legalized in 2015. Yeah. We got married in 2017. We, we benefit from the people who came before us and, 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 and ra rallied for, uh, legalization of you know gay marriage and like the big thing was like gays couldn't stay together or whatever when there's actually so many examples if you look them up there's so many examples of gay couples who stayed together for so long and the thing that they were trying to do yeah and th th this was definitely in my in my head every time that i'd look at it he'd be like i am a gay married man i want it to be known that i'm not a single man mm. like he was scared that people would think that he'd be getting AIDS. So this is another conversation. Because yeah. this was all during the AIDS epidemic as well. I don't want to talk about the criticisms that they got. Not only for, it, you know, it seemed disingenuous and it seemed like they were just trying to make money off of their relationship, but also people were saying that you you are um, selling yourself out to uh, 
straight heterosexual, you know, conservatives oh, yes. because you are trying to like, you know, have a traditional marriage. Tradition, you're, you keep saying you want a monogamous marriage, that you guys are monogamous. Yeah. You know, you, this is monogamous marriage. And I, I understand that, right? Because um, the queer lifestyle has always been an othered type of lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? We've always kind of lived our lifestyles in, in a bunch of different shades and ways and just like to the beats of our own drum, how we feel like we should go, right? Because heterosexual society, we didn't... It, didn't, it wasn't accessible. Like, we didn't... Marriage was That was not accessible to like, us, so you know, we couldn't live that. All you of know? that, it, 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 it wasn't there for us, and therefore... Uh, I understand people being like super against, you know, yeah. monogamy and all that stuff. Which he, he does say several times, you know, he yeah. supports... Any way you live or structure your relationship. Yeah, he's basically you know, saying just don't judge us for the way we want to live. Our, uh, we want to have, you know, yes, our relationship. Valid. If, and we're not going to do that for you. Um, they, they kind of had all of the cards stacked in their favor. Um, I know that I don't want to discount any of the any of the hardships they went through, right? I'm sure they got plenty of, you know, shitty mail and a lot of like really, you know, sickening comments. But they were a couple of really good looking white men who were cis. cis. <laughs> There's a woke term for you. C I S, uh, were, not S I S. They were cisgender. <laughs> they they you know were they had the aesthetic of like you know the really fit. So they had all the privileges. You know they were yeah. the perfect poster child for you know what they, they were. What was yeah what, something that you know maybe white was more palatable. Yeah, for exactly the heterosexual exactly community <laughs> i think they were like extremely palatable yes um as as the way they looked and the way they conducted themselves and you know they were a couple that um uh, you know bumfuck redneck in tennessee he can't like you know call bob paris out you're gonna call bob paris out you know this this um six foot 230 this guy pounds, with the body of a Adonis. god yeah like are you, yeah. you you can't you know tear him down um and i think that in that way they were extremely fortunate and they you know i think in the advocate magazine article that we that we kind of read the last one that john p thomas getting shout out uh, sent to us they make a good point in saying that if these guys had been had not been as good looking would they have had the same attention and the same you know sort of press and and benefits probably not probably not you know um i mean never say not because i'll do, but like the thing is that they the had chances so not, much the chances would would not have been there you know and, it, 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 and that that doesn't take anything away from them like they were extremely brave for coming forward like they would one thing that i i i i took out of this is um uh bob was saying that they were not afraid of pda it didn't matter where they were yeah. they were going to hold hands and i was like thinking to myself i was like even nowadays in 2022 Zach and i we're still unless, nervous. I'm very nervous to do that. In public. Unless we're in a gay district. Yeah. We do not hold hands. Um, it, I don't it, want to say do not. We've done it. We've done it. But not, not frequently. Often. Like, not often. Like, like, kind of like secretly or like people aren't, aren't around us or anything like that. But like also like I feel like when, when you are a six foot something, 230 pounds of muscle. Yeah. Who's going to mess with you? Yeah. Who's, who's, who's going to get in your face about it? Right. Yeah. It's just, uh, and, I, and I don't see, you know, I'm not really criticizing them for who they are, right? And being the couple that got the chances and the, got the, the press opportunities and got the opportunities in general, you know? Um, I'm just kind of pointing out what some people were criticizing about it, right? That they were criticizing, well, of course they're doing well and they're going to do well with this relationship. And maybe that's why some people were a little bit upset because they were like, well, you know, you put a gay Mexican couple on the cover of something or a gay black couple. And are they going to get the, the, the same, same attention? Yeah, probably not. Especially at that time, you know, um, they were just, I, I think the, the correct word here is palatable. And I think they were just the most palatable couple that could have come out at that time. It's kind of similar to when you have people, um, who have to do, you know, they have to, you know, fix their, you know, like, change their way of speaking, yeah. you know, in the workplace to be more pal palatable to their white, you know, colleagues, yeah. you know, it, um, and here th they were palatable, but the, uh, the, the thing is also, um, they were, 
you can tell, especially after the fact that they weren't happy for a while and they were trying to keep up this image yeah. of who they were and they were trying to be role models like ter- long-term relationship And whether ro- they were models. trying to be or they just saw themselves as role models or wanted to keep up all of the benefits that they were getting, you know, they still felt an immense amount of pressure to keep it together. They they were separated for about a year before they even broke up. They were living in the same house separated, not telling anybody, you know. It was they were really trying to keep this public relationship going as, as, by any means possible, you know. They were Scared of breaking up, Bob Bob Paris. I totally believe him too when when he says that he was scared of breaking up because he was scared of letting down the cause, right? Yes. And that they had made the relationship so public, and so breaking up would would have been like a failure, you know, a public failure, a very public, embarrassing failure. Um, and you know, there's that myth that gay relationships don't work and that they burn out real quick and that everybody, you know, is infatuated and they fall in love really quick and then it burns out in, in a couple years at most. You know, they move in together really quick and then they're moving right back out. Um, and they didn't want to contribute to that. They didn't want to be that statistic of it. They, they don't. They don't want to be the example yeah. that people pointed at. Be like, see, it doesn't well, work. Because a lot Game of people doesn't work. A lot of people were all yes, exactly. Yeah. And but also a lot of people were uh, really holding them up on a pedestal, saying like, look, this is the example of the gay relationship we can aspire to. This is mm-hmm. the example that everybody that we all need to aspire to, right? Um, and I think in a way, they yeah, they they totally contributed to that themselves you know they put themselves on that pedestal and they sat happily up there you know um and it came back to bite them in the ass uh it it's you know there's maybe this is statistic especially and we're talking more about at this time right because there were no other there weren't really gay relationships that people had to like kind of reference and look to it wasn't it just wasn't that common back then especially publicly you know, yeah. and so if the statistics seemed greater that, you know, gay relationships didn't work, it was because one, they didn't get to do that in high school. They didn't get to date around and figure out how to do a relationship. Right. So they're going into their first relationship and that's the bur- the big, you know, burning bright one that also burns out super quick. Um, and it just is like there's so many factors. Well, to- and there's people around it like during this time, around 70 percent of people still believed that uh, being a homosexual was a sin. Yes. You know, and uh, you have this public pressure. And a lot of times I do see uh, Bob talk about in his books, um, the way to get to our heterosexual peers is to humanize ourselves. Yeah. You know, we're your cousins, we're your brothers, we're your sons, you know, your dads. I think they made a really good point on, it was either Oprah or Donahue, I don't remember that. There was so much... And still is so much like pushback to queers because these people probably don't know any out queers in their lives, right? They don't have a, a reference point that they know personally. You know, they don't have somebody who I, I would like to think with members of our family that, that we've we've helped that, to open their minds a little bit, you know, having yes. a couple of gays in their family. Um, but there's a lot of families who like, you know. If there is somebody gay in their family, and I think they said the statistic was one out of four families had a gay person in it. If they did have a family member in it, you know, that person that probably wasn't out. And so, you know, their family was like, oh, we don't have any gays. See, it's not that common. It's not that, not this, not that. It just, it was such an interesting time. And it's so hard for me to think back and relate to that time because things are so different now. And we are very much backsliding. Um, it is, it's getting kind of scary, but it's still... You know, it just doesn't. It doesn't look like that. You know, it, it's weird because it looks like we're backsliding, but not. But you, because you see all the statistics of like, there's more people coming out every year. Yeah. But you also see like all of all of this legal uh, attempts to reform stuff yeah. to uh, really take the LGBTQ plus like name out of you know any public area. Um, but uh, one thing that. Uh, uh, Bob said that I thought was interesting is that he was caught between two generations, Generation X and the boomers, where he thinks that if he was a boomer, he would have stayed closeted forever. Um, and Gen X, he was seeing with his generation of Gen X, if people to start coming out and starting to like actually be out and open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so their relationship just doesn't work out and that's okay. I think, you know, I think it, it was more embarrassing because they made it so public and they kind of 
put themselves as the face of like the perfect gay relationship. Yeah. And then when it didn't work out, yeah, that was embarrassing to them. But, you know, they kind of made that bed and they laid in it. But I also don't think this adds to any sort of statistic that gay relationships don't work because Bob Paris, right after this, like pretty quick after this, by the way, um, 1996, he marries, he, he, he gets married again. Was, did he get married in 1996 or was it 2001? Oh, I found somebody in 1996. He started dating him. I think they got married in 2003. 2003? Yeah. And even now, they've got 19 years of marriage. Yeah, exactly. So he did get a long-term gay relationship. You know, it just, that was his first big relationship. That was his first big romance. And sometimes our first big romances just don't work out. It just, that doesn't always happen that way, right? My first big romance didn't work out. I thought it was, I was like obsessed with this guy. And I was like, this is the one. And now I think back and I'm like, oh my God, you were so stupid. You're such an idiot. My first big romance worked out. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so yeah. we're like, we're like, we got half chances here. <laughs> we're halfway there. Um, um, it's you know, just, yeah. And so I'm super happy for him that it like, you so know. He, he, he married Brian. Yeah, he's not a tragic story. I don't think Bob Paris is a tragic story. He married a guy named Brian. They're still together. They live in Canada. Bob is like, they're both really private. You can't find shit on Rob. On Rod. It's uh, interesting because he was Jackson. private, but also still led like a public life yeah. up until 2020. Differently though, right? Like he started you know? a website and he like posts his poetry and he's a very, so his Generation Queer book, I, I really wanted to read that one because I figured that was going to have all of the gay tidbits in it. It is very philosoph- I, philosophical. I, I read it. It's kind of rambly, I, I, I would <laughs> okay. say. Very well, philosophical. For what we were doing with this episode is we were really just wanting to tell his story or tell, you know, a version of his story. Um, And I am very into philosophical ramblings. And so I really do want to go oh. back and read that, but that wasn't yeah. the right book for, for, for this. this. Yes. Yes. Um, and I really enjoy that. He's like in a very philosophical mindset. He's all his book is talking about. He just does walks through the forest, talks about antlers and, and Buffalo. Uh, and he talks about religion and, and religion. spiritualism and being close to nature. Yeah. So and he's in a very like self-reflective, deep thinking place right now in life. And he's just writing poetry and like kind of writing, you know, short prose about his life and the flashback Fridays. And again, he hasn't really done anything since 2020 that I can find like publicly, Mm -hmm. but it just seems like he's, Fine now he's also not huge anymore. He's lost all of his body. Yeah, mass. I think he does like more yoga than he does. I think he looks perfectly fine. He looks very handsome still. Yeah, like he's he's still a gorgeous. He's a guy. silver fox. Hey, he's a silver fox. Um, and I'm just really happy for him with how his life turned out. You know, the act he had a little bit of an acting career. He starred in a musical, the musical Jubilee with B. Arthur. It's a pretty big deal at Carnegie yeah. Hall. Um, recur- recurring role on Defying Gravity. It's just I, I would like to think he's happy. I think he needs to write. His book now, I think he did a lot of like memoir, memoirs and self-reflective books, <laughs> like points in his life where they were too early. And I would like to know what he thinks, well, what he, how he looks back on his life now and what he would have to say about the relationship with Rod, the, the coming out in the bodybuilding community post that, you know, I, I want to hear all of his philosophical ramblings on, now. on his website. It said that he was working on two fiction no, novels yeah. so and, and a screenplay. Well, this is the time um, for him so, to have his memoir come out, his autobiography, yes. and then they make a documentary based on the autobiography, and it's very Tab Hunter, right? I, I could see a movie. There you go. I could see a movie. It should be a, who's complaining, though. Yeah. Or a Lifetime TV show. Lifetime? I don't know. I, I feel like there's drama. Oh, there. you're done. You're done. Canceled. Oh, oh, yeah. The Lifetime people wouldn't like it. Would they? Yeah. I would suggest going and reading some of his books if you want more information. There's He's got a lot of a lot of books out there that he's written. Um, definitely recommend Gorilla Suit. Uh, <laughs> straight from the heart, I am going to finish it because I, wanna, I want more into their relationship. It's just so like, oh, our relationship is just – we're just soulmates. And, and it's really hard reading something like that knowing – that that just didn't that wasn't that wasn't how it even played out. Well, know? and uh, we only read his uh, fiction books about his life. We didn't read any of his fitness books. Yes, and so, I also want to go back and so look at that because I, I, I know pretty, those have been pretty successful. I'm pretty interested in the bodybuilding community. Yeah, now, right? I, I am. I I, I kind of want to get uh, his first book yeah. and look at it. Um, I have no interest some in joining of the, tips. the bodybuilding community. I, I have no interest either. Bodybuilding as a sport has a lot of gay fans, and I think I'm a new gay fan. Are you moving the stuff for our outro? I think the, the, the fourth wall's been broken, but here, okay, let's care. set up for the outro. Set up for the outro. Is it still filming? 
<laughs> guys, that was such a fun recording. I'm so happy you guys sat with us through that. And uh, I had a really good time. I had a fantastic think, time talking about bears. We, we, we had really good discussion points, and I think that this was overall a very productive recording session. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, <laughs> again, if you like this episode, if you if you had a good time with us, uh, make sure you share it. Leave us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify and uh, comment down below. And we will, yeah, we'll see you for the Monday show. We're still going to have a Monday show with topics and all of that. We're a little bit late on this episode, but we still will have the Monday show. Yep. See you then. Adios.